to Evan Smith and the Texas Tribune for their valued partnership with Texas Community Colleges. You know, Evan has graciously invited these important policy conversations at more than a dozen community colleges. And he praises the merits of community colleges in many, many public events. And Evan, we thank you for that support. For those of you who are on our campus for the first time, I want to add a special welcome. Brazosport College is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. We have had 50 years of strong community and industry support, but we could be no happier than to be celebrating the election of District 25's own state representative as Speaker of the House. We are, we are so very, very proud of Speaker Bonin. We are thrilled with his leadership for Texas, and I want you to know that throughout his 22-year career in the Texas legislature, Speaker Bonin has been an advocate for his district, and Brazosport College could ask for no stronger or more committed friend than we have in Dennis. So thank you, Dennis. You know, we're honored to be hosting Evan and Speaker Bonin. And as we begin the 86th legislature, I think it's fitting that we have, I know, three other members of the House that have joined us today. Representative Greg Bonin, glad to have you here. <laughs> Representative Ed Thompson, who I spoke to earlier. And Representative Sean Theory, thank you for joining us. Additionally, there are many other elected officials, supporters, friends, and civic leaders that are gathered here today. Thank you for your presence and for your leadership. I am grateful that many of my colleagues who are fellow presidents of Texas Community Colleges are joining us today. And I would like to introduce them and say that together, Texas Community Colleges enroll more than 730,000 students in higher ed. With us today, representing community colleges, first I want to recognize members of my Board of Regents, our Vice Chairman Robert Perriman, Jason Cordoba, Roland Hendricks, and Steve Solis. <laughs> Joining me at the head table, I have fellow college presidents, Crystal Albrecht, Alvin Community College, Dennis Brown, Lee College, Kevin Fagan, Navarro College, David Hines, Victoria College, Betty McCrowan, Wharton County Junior College, and Jacob Ferrari, President of the Texas Association of Community Colleges. Thank you for joining me. Finally, before I introduce Evan, I want to share one finding from a public opinion poll to be released next week. So you're getting breaking news. According to the 101, the higher ed poll of Texas being released to the public on January 23rd, we learned that Texans who don't currently have college degrees are most likely to turn to community colleges if they decide to pursue further education. They are seen, that is community colleges, as a likely education resource by 43% of those with some college but no degree, 47% of those with a high school diploma only, and almost half of those with no high school diploma. Followed by four-year public institutions at 28%, 22%, and 18% respectively. I can say that my colleagues and I are ready for these students. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Evan Smith co-founder and CEO of the Texas Tribune. Evan, thank you for joining us in Lake Jackson. Speaker Bonin, thank you for picking Brazosport College as the venue for this important discussion. Good afternoon. 
It is so nice to be in Lake Jackson. I remind people when I leave Austin that I live in the fake Texas. This is the real Texas. Thank you for welcoming us to the real Texas. I am Evan Smith, the CEO of the Texas Tribune. I want to thank Dr. Valak. I want to thank everybody here at Brazosport College. A huge thank you to Casey Guthrie and the staff of this amazing institution, along with my friend Jacob Frere from the Community College Association for welcoming us here. Please give them a big hand. They are our hosts today, and they made it possible for us to be here. Uh, very, very quick housekeeping before we bring the speaker up. Uh, the Texas Tribune, you know, is a non partisan, nonprofit digital news organization. Part of what we do are events all over the state of Texas, as Dr. Ballack said, many on the campuses of community colleges. Those events are free to attend. They're not free to put on. Sponsors make it possible for us to do these events, to provide your lunch, to make it possible for you to come together, meet one another, talk, and, and hear a good conversation, hopefully, and walk away better informed and more productive and thoughtful citizens of this state. Our sponsors are AT&T, Walmart, the Texas Association of Community Colleges, Community Health Choice, Pearson, the Hatton W. Sumner's Foundation, and our sponsor of all events during the 86th legislative session, Bills Up Now. Please acknowledge our sponsors, give them a hand, as they made it possible for us to be here. As well as any of you who are members of the Texas Tribune, we thank you very much, and if you're not a member, we encourage you to become one. Please silence your phones in deference to people in the room and on our live stream. There are many people who I think would have loved to be here but are watching from other places in the state. And so we have a lot of people online. If you tweet about this event, I'll encourage you to do so. Hashtag TT events. We will talk about 35 or 40 minutes. We're going to open up the microphones on either side of the room for questions. Please, when you get up to ask a question before we end at one o'clock, do not make a speech, please ask a question. And I'm going to try to move it along to get to as many of you as possible. And I apologize in advance if we can't get to everybody's question. We'll get you back on the road by one o'clock. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our distinguished guest, Dennis Bonin, the 76th Speaker of the Texas House, selected by a unanimous vote of his colleagues to preside over the lower chamber of the legislature, succeeding the retiring Joe Strauss when the 86th session gaveled in on January 8th. He now occupies the most powerful post not popularly elected in the state of Texas. An Angleton Republican, Speaker Bonin, is a veteran House member, ninth in seniority among the 150, first elected in 1996, now in his 12th term representing District 25. Do the math. He was also a sergeant in the House before. He has been in the Texas House more than half his life. In previous sessions, his leadership roles included Speaker Pro Tem, Chair of the Ways and Means Committee, Chair of the Special Purpose Districts Committee, and Chair of the Sunset Advisory Commission, the CEO and Chairman of Heritage Bank in Pearland. The speaker is a native of Houston and a graduate of St. Edwards University in Austin. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Dennis Bonin. Mr. Speaker, good afternoon. Thank you. Good to be with you. It is, in fact, a home game, it turns out, right? We hope so. It is. Well, we're now, so happy now, to be quick, here. Real quick, though, I'm not native to Houston. I was born in a hospital there and came to Angleton quickly. Okay, very well. So true but not accurate, as so much of what the press does. I get it. All right. You said it. Mr. Speaker, I want to go back to May the 16th of 2018, a column by my colleague Ross Ramsey. You know Ross for many years. It was about possible candidates for speaker, May the 16th. The headline was four declared candidates for Texas speaker and at least one no way. And here is the lead of the, of the column. As the members of the Texas House, not to mention the rest of us, try to figure out who all is in the running to replace House Speaker Joe Strauss, a declaration of non-candidacy is refreshing. State Representative Dennis Bonin, Republican of Angleton, says he is not now and will not become a candidate for speaker. Take him off the list. You literally called Ross, who wrote a story speculating. Oh, no, I didn't call him. I almost ran him over. You almost ran him <laughs> over. He wrote a column speculating you'd be a candidate, and you made a point of saying to him, take me off the list. I will not be a candidate. Correct. What happened? Well, you know what happened. I, well, I do, but I want you to um, tell it. The truth is about... 30 members, not 40, it was reported as 40, but about 30 Republican members got together on a Sunday night, and leading into that Sunday night, uh, my phone rang significantly yep. over the weekend saying, we're going to meet, and we're going to put together 
uh, a list of candidates, and we have committed to each other that if we can agree, we're going to come out of that room with a candidate that we're all going to back for speaker. And they started calling saying, I don't want to waste one of my names on you, but I think you should do this. But I'm not putting you down if you won't do it. And I said, I'm not doing it. And they said, well, what if we put your name down? And I said, that's your choice. I'm not asking you to. I'd prefer you not, but you choose that. And they came out of that meeting, and uh, they had, I don't know if it was unanimous, but the two or three who weren't unanimous uh, didn't sign, and they left, uh, which is fair. And uh, they had 30 names yep. plus uh, asking me to run. And by that point, that was, what, a week and a half before the November election? Correct. The uh, And there are six other Republicans in the race at this point and one Democrat, none of whom has gotten traction in the speaker's race, right? Yes. Um, traction is could be defined in different it, ways. It's a subjective characterization. That's right. Yeah, right. That's right. Yeah. They didn't have 76 votes. We know that. Um, no, and, and they probably didn't have 30 either. Um, Are you all able to hear the speaker okay? Because I'm going to hand him my microphone if you can't hear him and through his. I can talk louder. Okay. Try that. There you go. That's better. Is that not better? No. Here, let's switch. They'd prefer to hear me. They're here to see you. <laughs> I know. But, but we should have yours work better, oh, too. Uh, I'm loud by nature. I'm in the media. Um. So, so anyhow, what really had happened, and, and, and Evan, I appreciate you saying, the others had not gotten traction. Right. And so for me, um, candidly, and I appreciate those men and women who did that, but, but also I kind of was shoved in at that point. Um, many people won't know. There's a speaker's statute that, that governs how speaker's races can and, and are conducted. And so, and we really ought to change it, to be honest, but... It is against the law for a member of the legislature to talk to anyone about them being speaker without having filed the paperwork saying they're running for speaker. You have to declare. Yes. And so it, right. it put me, and I'm not complaining, into a very awkward position of if I'm even going to discuss being speaker, I've got to go file saying I will be speaker. Um, and when your wife is an ethics lawyer, it really makes it hard. Right. Because um, I told her I could hang out in that gray area for a couple of days and she says well one day was long enough for gray let's move on um and you have to file whether you're doing this or not but what opened me up to it was what those men and women did is they they created a path of creating an opportunity to, yes it was me but really for anyone to become speaker by building coalitions and bringing them together and I fear that not any of the other candidates, but anyone else at that point would have created a very bastardized coalition of members that would have not created a good governance base to have a very successful Texas House. Your, your goal, Mr. Speaker, was to bring the House together. You've Correct. said that many times. And That's so you right. believe your candidacy, probably alone among the candidates in the race, had the greatest potential of bringing the House together. When those 30 came together, 30-plus came together, right. it created the clearest path right. to accomplish that. You, you had seen other speakers operate. You'd been Speaker Pro Tem under Speaker Strauss. You'd been in the House during his entire tenure. You were in this House during Speaker Craddock's entire tenure. You were in the House during Speaker Laney's tenure. So you had seen how other speakers operated. When you thought about being speaker, were you trying to fix something or were you trying to do something? Did you react to what you had seen and say, I want to not do it that way, I want to do it this way? What got me in the race was wanting to do it this way, was wanting to make sure we bring the House together. The House, a speaker's race can break the House or it can build the House up. And I saw the opportunity to build it up. Yeah. And so um, the model for me is most closely to Speaker Laney's model, uh, which Speaker Laney always said, vote your district's members. The members drive the issues. The members drive the process. The members are, are the drivers of what happens in this house. So the one thing I'm uncomfortable with already is Speaker Strauss is a dear friend and allowed me amazing opportunities. And you, I'm going to jump ahead of you, I'm sure. You're at some point going to say, well, how are you going to be different from Joe Strauss? Well, sure. Um, I'm going to be really different. 
because I'm a ball headed guy from Angleton and, and, and not a full headed hair guy from San Antonio. Um, but we're going to be different because we're two different men. Right. Um, and I think it's why I did a good job working so closely with him is that we complemented each other's styles and personalities. But, but, you but we're going to be yeah. different because we're different. But, but, but you acknowledge that stylistically you and Speaker Strauss are, in fact, d different. I mean, every two people are different. I don't want to offend right? Speaker Strauss by suggesting we're the same. You think that would offend him? That's <laughs> good, good line. Um, but but I, I guess I go back to Speaker Laney because I looked up your first session in the House when Speaker Laney was Speaker. It was 82 Democrats and 68 Republicans. It was almost the precise inverse of the Republican, the Democrat split. Now, you know what it was like to be in the minority and you know what it was like to be in a house that had a reasonably narrow partisan split because that was your first session. This is familiar territory for you. Yes, I actually um, the Democrat caucus created a Democratic caucus committee on the speaker's race and um, stupid me. Uh, agreed to meet with that committee the Wednesday morning after the November election. Uh, so that, that was a pretty exciting time. And, right. And that went as well as it could. Uh, it actually went very well. But I told them that morning, I said, you ought a really good night. I said, and if you want the majority, you shouldn't support me to be speaker because I'm going to bring the House together and we're going to get big things done and we're going to keep winning elections as Republicans. And, and that's going to make an argument to voters in 2020 that we did the business of the state, and so you shouldn't turn people out of office, as happened in some cases this time. That's exactly correct. That, that's right. So uh, you've made public education a priority. We've heard you say it over and over. In fact, I think at one point you said my top three items are public education, public education, public education, and then maybe property tax kind of worked in there. Um, I feel like I've heard it identified by speakers as a priority every time. And by the end of every session, it's like Charlie Brown and Lucy and the football. The minute we go to kick that ball, it gets pulled away. Why should we believe you, Mr. Speaker, this time? Well, I put styrofoam cups in the members' lounge that say it. I mean, right. you know. Where, where's my cup, by the way? I was hoping you'd bring me a sleeve of cups. Well, I thought we were meeting in Austin, and I'd, I'd give you one there. Okay. But um, yeah, very fair question. Why you should believe it this time is because I'm not the one driving it. The members are. Every single member of the Texas House will tell you we must get school finance reform. And, and they're saying that, Mr. Speaker, why? Because, again, I think I've heard in previous sessions individual members say we think this is a priority. Why are they saying it now, and why do you believe them so that we can believe you? Well, because they're trustworthy people, for one. But, two... Things are aligning as you need them to. Um, we have the revenues to do it. Um, I'm very proud the base budget I put, put out for the Texas House, $9 billion additional funds for public education. Right. That's big. So thank you. But, but, but I want to be fair. That is part of why we can do it. I mean, we didn't have the luxury of $9 billion that we could have put into public education in some of the more previous sessions, more recent. And so that is a huge opportunity. Right. The election matters. Um, look, I think Governor Abbott, Lieutenant Governor Patrick, every member of the Senate, every member of the House, myself included, went, they want us to start solving these problems. You heard, a message not, from, you, heard, you heard a message from the voters, take care of business this session or we're coming for you next time. Absolutely. Right. And it's a message that I'm glad was delivered. Right. Uh, I told the Republican caucus uh, the day before we began session, I said, we got to start delivering on big issues and get in, in no offense to my constituents. And I said, and some of y'all better get real serious about it because I'll keep winning in my seat because it's a Republican seat. But some of you are going to find yourselves right being replaced by the opposite party some some of the ones who won barely this last time won't be so lucky n if next we time. don't deliver right. on real issues will you, will you mr speaker properly set our expectations as it relates to fixing uh, public school finance uh, last session when uh, chairman huberty sat with me at the beginning of the session he said this is not going to get done in one session so don't come into this session thinking even most optimistically but that by the time the session is over great all fixed are you prepared to tell us that you can fix this in one session or not? My answer is different than what Huberty's was. Now, Huberty's answer was what it was because we didn't have the money 
to fix it in one session. Right. But having been in the legislature long enough, I'm never going to declare such a significant issue as school finance is fixed. I think we can make significant change and improvement. Right. But I think we're more in a decade by decade. Our economy, our schools are so dynamic. The growth that we have in Texas, it'd be foolhardy for any legislator or any individual to say we have solved school finance forever. Yeah. So if we can create a solution, which I believe we can for in this session, that puts school finance on the right track for at least the next decade, we will have succeeded. So that's the metric by which we should judge you and the House, is whether you've successfully done what you just said. I Put it on the, right, on the right path. I think that's fair. Um, and, and I want to hear, yeah. that is a significant change from where from, we from, are From today. previous sessions. You catch what I'm right. saying. I, it's absolutely. ignorant to say we yeah. fixed it. Right. I get that. But you understand that what Huberty was talking about, really what I'm talking about, is you're going to make significant enough progress that we see visibly that you've done what you said you were going to do. Brazosport and Sweeney ISDs had better see a real difference Improvement, on the recap, right. on so, recapture. So, so let's talk about Brazosport and Sweeney ISDs. You, you may have some people from Brazosport and Sweeney ISDs or anybody else from the public education community I, here in the I room. I paid their registration. So Did you make it come? Well, it was free. Joke's on exactly. you. Exactly. Right. Um, we'll send you a tax letter. That's fine. Um, uh, what are you going to be asking for from them? in exchange for this money? Because I read the School Finance Commission report. I know the conversation has been around giving more money to public schools, but you yourself have been clear. We're not just giving you the money. We expect some form of accountability, performance in return. So we know what the metrics are to judge you by. What are the metrics that you're going to use to judge them by? We want the kids of Texas to be prepared to be productive citizens and a part of the job force. Whether it's college, whether it's workforce immediately out of high school, that's what we're going to request of our public schools. I think they're delivering it right. today, but we can always see if there's a way to do it even better. No one, Mr. Speaker, would disagree with that because there are no specifics in there. That's why I gave that answer. I know that. I know that. You've, been, you've done this before. We have a story on the Texas Tribune this morning talking about the prospects some have raised that high-stakes testing may return to the conversation. No. At a high level. You're not, taking not that off I, the table as a metric of there, accountability. There, there will be accountability. Right. But I've carried legislation to end high stakes right, testing. Right, right. That's against what you think. Right, yeah. Right. Correct. And, and, and let me follow up on that. Yeah. Um, I'm tired of the joke being on the legislature. I carried How's a that? bill. Yeah. Larry Taylor, who's now our senator for Angleton North, uh, the chair of education in the Senate, although the Senate committees no. just came out. I assume he still Five is. minutes ago, he is still chair of public education. God bless Larry. Okay, he made it. Yeah. So we carried a bill together when he was still a lowly House member. And uh, it was ending the star test and all the garbage. And we simply wanted what happened to Larry and I when we were in school, like everyone in this room. Our teacher gave us a test at the end of the year on what she or he had taught us that year. Right. And it turned into a whole boon goggle of money in testing. That was never the intention of the legislation Senator Taylor and I passed. When we were in the House together. All right, so if it's not going to be high-stakes testing, then what metrics specifically, Mr. Speaker, will you be looking to the school districts to provide you to justify the expense of this additional money? I love you asked specifically because I'm the Speaker now, and I don't have to be specific. The uh, Oh, man. You've heard me say that, and I want everyone to understand one of the beauties of being Speaker and one of the beauties of the model of being Speaker is that the speaker puts the voice and the strength of the speaker's office behind the big issues that the members have driven to the top. So the members will finance. decide. The members exactly. will decide what those specific metrics but are. Right. I will make sure that we make that decision and we produce the result. Right. So, again, you may tell me you don't want to offer specifics on this, but I'm going to ask anyway. One difference between the House-based budget and the Senate-based budget as it relates to funding public education is the Senate-based budget specifically calls out their allocation of additional money for teacher pay. I think of that as kind of a very, like almost like a categorical grant. This is more in the Senate, in the House's case, more like a block grant. Basically, you're saying we're going to allocate this money and we're going to talk about how that money gets allocated to the schools and everything later. Do you agree with the decision of the Senate to call teacher payouts specifically? And if so, why didn't you all do it in the House? Well, because the lieutenant governor said, why don't you do yours as a block grant? And I'll make it real clear how much we want to do a specific pay grant. You all work teachers. that out in advance? To some extent. Really? 
We are working incredibly well together. I know it's disheartening. Well, I'll come to the kumbaya. I, it really is, well together. The, the press is miserable. We hope the kumbaya moment ends in about, you know, a week, actually. And you will try. I well, I'm, I'm trying, in fact, right now, because I'm going to ask you why it's a good idea to allocate money specifically for teacher pay. But I understand that the plan in the Senate is $5,000 per teacher, period. Good teachers, bad teachers, in between teach. What if a school district says, you know what, we were hit really badly by Harvey, and we'd rather use the money you want to give us for teacher pay to renovate facilities. Why are you forcing those districts to use the money for that? Why can't they tell you how they should use it? Well, I'm not. Mine has a block grant. There you go. Okay. With that said. Right. You understand the point. I understand the point completely. But what's today, January 18th? Yes, sir. Right now is the time that the legislature works best when you put diverse ideas on the table to solve the big problem. So that's an idea. And that's an idea. Not not determined that that's what's going to happen. Well, that's what we're in Austin to do over the next right. hundred and whatever days. And if I ask you what you think about that personally, you're going to tell me it's going to be the members who will decide in the House. That is exactly correct. Boy, oh, boy. Okay, fine. Discipl- um, discipline's no fun. No, it is, it's absolutely no fun. I agree. Um, so you all are $3 billion apart, according to, again, a story that we published on public education, roughly. Um, that a good starting point as far as you're concerned? I think it's a phenomenal starting point. Right. The, if you look at the Senate-based budget and the House-based budget, we are probably closer than we've been in a long time on right. big issues. And the governor, lieutenant governor, and I are having All on the same page. We, we really are. So being $3 billion apart, you look at that at this vantage point, January the 18th, you think we can get there. There's, there's no question we can get there. There is no question we can get there, and I don't even think we're really $3 billion apart. If you you think it's that, less? I think it's less. Right. Uh, the lieutenant governor looked at me the other day, and he says, I thought we were going to spend more out of the rainy day fund. And I said, we will. He says, you didn't have it in your base budget. I said, I know, don't worry about it. You had $4 billion in yours from the rainy day fund. We had about a billion. Um, we're going to get there. You'll, you'll get we're there. We're going to get there. Right. So the Part B of the agenda for this session has been property tax reform or relief, depending upon who's talking about it. This is an issue that you know well. Reform. 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 Guy who chaired the tax committee last time was named Bonin. Right. You know this issue as well as anybody. You also remember how it didn't get done last time and how it blew up at the end of the session. Um, Why is this important? And and what do you want to accomplish so that we all actually feel the effects of it? Because I remember back in 06 when we did the swap out of the franchise tax and the, you know, the, the property tax. We were supposed to feel this property tax relief and people got so little that they didn't even know there was a change. How can you make it so that we feel it? Well, it's why I stick to the words reform. Because, reform. Because the reality of it is the system needs to be reformed. There's a lack of transparency. Uh, the taxpayer should be on the winning side of the discussion, meaning the taxpayer shouldn't have to struggle, fight, and do all the homework to just figure out where their money's going, right. who's getting it, why they're getting more, or who is getting more, or what happened to this and what happened to that. So the transparency that we passed last session um, that fell aside, there was complete agreement between the lieutenant governor and myself and the House on the transparency and the governor, of course, on the transparency pieces, um, which I think were, you know, decades of transformation in progress on that issue. But they fell aside because of not finding agreement on the uh, revenue or lowering the rollback rate, which is now being called revenue caps um, this time. And so, and so we're clear, for the audience's benefit, the de- deal was you all were in agreement that beyond a certain percentage increase, local officials should not be able to raise property taxes without going to the voters. That was the, that, fun- that that was the fundamental correct. part of it. That's right. You all were at 6%. The Senate was at 4%. I think we got to 5 didn't we? Maybe we were at six. I don't remember. I thought you had been a bit of a nightmare. But the point is, the difference was not significant, but it was enough that you all couldn't come to common purpose. And then after the legislature was over, when the governor was campaigning, he said, basically, hold my beer. We're going to now say two and a half percent should be the threshold. Right. With some different metrics in there. But roughly, we're talking about that's the, the, the sticking point now is what should the percentage. Well, be. Yes. But. The governor's. The four and the six and all of that were just flat numbers, simple. That's all there is to it. Right. The governor's plan has some components to it where it's not a flat, hard two and a half. Right. 
um, there's some other metrics to it that are allowed to move that number. Up is that up. likely, Mr. Speaker, to be the conversation again this session, whatever form reform takes, that it will start with bringing the voters into the conversation beyond a certain agreed upon threshold? I think it's clear that's where it will right. be. You know, the pushback, Mr. Speaker, has been if you're looking for accountability for local officials who get off the leash, we already have that accountability. It's called elections. If the mayor of Angleton or a city council member or a Brazoria County commissioner is participates in the increase of taxes beyond what the voters want, they've already got a way to say that they don't like it. They vote them out of office. So why not just do that? Well, it, it does happen some of the time, but right. the reality of it is the voter feels that they don't have the ability to have that reaction to that immediacy of their taxes going up. They don't want to wait until election. That's time. right. Right. And, and, and the, the truth of it is, if you really look at the historic numbers, uh, the reality of it is most of the revenue caps that have been discussed in these communities that I represent, they aren't hitting those numbers. Um, they're staying below it. It only affects a certain portion of the state, but not, right. not, not everybody. Um, That's right. you, you know, Mr. Speaker, the other thing that you'll hear from local officials, heard it last session when they came up to lobby all of you, and they'll hear it, I'm sure, again this session, is we don't have enough money to provide the services that our constituents expect, and you're tying our hands. You're making it impossible for us to generate enough revenue to do the things we have to do. What do you say about that? We're not. You're not tying their hands? No. Because all they have to do is go to the voters. Well, one, they're yeah. seldom going to have to go to the voters. Right. And in the rare instances that they have to go to their voters, if they need more for police and fire and those things, I believe the voters, if they can make a good case and a good argument, the voters are going to agree with them. Well, if ultimately they can't say make yes. a good case. Right. Well, but if they can't make a good case, yeah. they're going to tell them no. They're going to tell them no. Um, uh, Mr. Speaker, the, the, the education and property tax thing have been joined. Right. That's correct. The complaint is the state has reduced its share of funding of public education so that now property taxes at the local level are going up to have to fill in that divot. And you want to see a reset so that property taxes go down. The state takes on a larger share of funding public correct. ed. Can you guarantee the people of this state that by reducing property taxes and raising public education that you'll accomplish the rebalancing but that new money will actually go into public education because some people are concerned that by lowering property taxes right. raising the state share ultimately for public ed's purposes it will be a wash i would be embarrassed if that happened so you're prepared to say it will not be a successful exercise if you don't not only rebalance but that you also put additional money over and above we are committed to true new dollars in right. public education. You alluded to recapture. You alluded to recapture as something that has bedeviled everybody in the context of the public education finance system. the day I had the honor of representing this district, I've had two original Robin Hood districts. Right. Is recapture dead after Dennis Bonin has been speaker for one session? That would be an ignorant thing to say because recapture, um, we don't have the dollars to declare it dead. So what happens to recapture? Should be, it should be rebalanced and overwhelmingly reduced. So Houston, because which has been, quick, yeah, right. If it were yes, dead, we'd all be back in court losing on equity. Right. So, so Houston, which has been burdened by this massive recapture payment, and they've been in this protracted negotiation with TEA over getting it down, or my home city of, Houston, of Austin, which has a massive recapture payment that makes the Houston recapture payment pale by comparison, there'll be some relief in some way, but that problem is not going away anytime soon. Well, it, it's it's fair to call it a problem, but you know, I'm kind of getting form letters in my office from Austin ISD about it, and I, I my staff doesn't want me to say this, but I've kind of wanted to tell them, welcome to the party. Um, we've been we've been at that party in right. EISD and Sweeney from the beginning of the time on that issue. Right. My point is, we can't talk about it unintelligently. If recapture goes away, we don't have equity. The reason we ended up in this spot was because of lawsuits, Edgewood, about equity. Right. And so what I would say to Houston and Austin ISD is that your payment should go down significantly. I don't know the details of Austin. It's not my job to. I think it's five to six hundred. Well, right? yeah, the million, number yeah, million, with so, respect yeah. is not significant. The point is, where are they in the line? Yes, sir. Go below that line. Right. Um, and we still hold equity because I also have the privilege, and I'm proud of representing Dan Barry and Columbia Brazoria, who received. They're dollars. on the receiving end of that. That's right. right. Yeah. And, and that's right. why I've always said I'm a good member to work on school finance. Yeah. Because it must be fair. I don't represent a district that we're all one way and we're all the other way. Right. We've got to be fair. And, and so 
anyone wanting to or trying to declare recapture dead doesn't understand the law right. and doesn't understand equity. There's enough money, yes or no, Mr. Speaker, in your plan for uh, putting money into public ed to adequately fund early childhood, pre-K. I'll answer this way. Yeah. It better be or Governor Abbott's going to be real unhappy with us. It's a major priority. Right, except, gov- except, Mr. Speaker, Governor Abbott has made early childhood a priority, in fact, maybe even an emergency, a couple of sessions in a row, and yet we still haven't gotten the ball over the finish line. So, again, I would say, no, again, why are, been, not, why are we not there? It has been funded. It but has been funded. Fu- funded sufficiently? Well, sufficient is a relative term. It is. It is. Long. It but is. But is, is early childhood education a priority of this legislature? It, it absolutely it is. How about teacher pe- retired teacher pensions? Every chance I speak, I talk about how we should use the rainy day fund to help take care of our retired teachers. In fact, your, ba- your base care. budget has funding out of the rainy day fund to help couple hundred million. shore up the, the teacher pension That's issue. That's exactly right. When I interviewed Speaker, uh, pardon me, Lieutenant Governor Patrick, Right before the see, we're getting along, so you can't tell the difference. I can't tell the t- yes. Well, you know, I did see the two of you in suits that were the same color on the lawn of the governor's mansion, practically holding hands and skipping through the daisies the other day. Evan, I did Evan, see that. Evan, if yes. you're, if you're going to coordinate your base budgets, you might as well coordinate your suits. coordinate your fashion. Right. Okay, good. Okay. Um, when I interviewed Lieutenant Governor Patrick. Uh, in October of 2016, before the 2017 session, he said we will not do school finance in the Senate without doing school choice, by which he meant some form of a voucher. I know that's itself the nomenclature is going to be one of those things we'll argue about. He said basically no one, he, his words were no one without the other. Your version of no one without the other this time is we are not going to do school finance without doing property tax reform. No one without the other. Yes. For sure. That's right. For sure. The people um, of Texas yeah. demand both. And they deserve both. Uh, let's talk about the budget and, first. And real yeah. quick. Yes, sir. And there's a monumental difference between school finance reform and property tax reform. They go hand in hand. Vouchers doesn't really go hand in the, hand. They did not. Um, you. Let's talk about the budget for a second. You know what the comptroller said you had to spend this time, about $8 billion more than uh, last time? In past sessions, I would have said, conservative legislature, you all are not going to come close to spending everything you have available to you, but you have a, a, a pretty full plate this time. You have a significant supplemental that you have to pass going backwards to cover the cost of things that you didn't fund previously. You've got the byproducts of Harvey. A lot of people ask me to ask you whether you're going to be able to put enough money in to make good on the promise to, to, recom- to come back from the storm. Um, and then you've got the public education stuff. Do you think you have enough in this budget to do everything you need to do? I think we do. And, and if you look at our base budget, we left about $3.9 billion unspent uh, in our base budget of revenue that's available that we're not using. And we are able to fund Harvey. That's one of the things I'm very proud of the Senate's base budget, where it is different from ours. We do help on Harvey. Right. But they use the rainy day fund. Um, for Harvey, and we're willing to do that in the House. Yeah. I can't, I'm not speak for every member, but I'm pretty confident. So are we that. now in a place, Mr. Speaker, where we're going to stop treating the rainy day fund like a Fabergé egg? Some precious jewel that well, can't be touched? Well, Evan. It actually rained. Evan. Yeah. Um, I want to keep the good times rolling, but right. you know that that's not been the perspective of the Texas House. I do, but I also and, and, know and that so it takes... our perspective yeah. has not changed. Right. We are still more than willing to recognize when a retired teacher's roof is leaking, we should support Go into the rain. Right. So you, you, you know that it requires a two-thirds vote of the House and a two-thirds vote of the Senate to access that money. You know the ideological composition or disposition of the House that you now lead and of the Senate where there's a narrower partisan split. Do you think that there are two-thirds votes in both chambers? Absolutely. To access because, money from Ray Day. Because there are two-thirds of the members of the House care about retired teachers. They care about Harvey recovery. They care about school finance. And they care about property tax. Right. One of the things that came out of the base budget, at least as we reported it, was a 3% decrease in health and human services. We talk a lot about public education, but health care is the same percentage or maybe a tiny bit more of the all-funds budget, I think, than education. And yet we've heard not a word about health care this interim or heading into this session we still have the most uninsured people in texas still have a, a shortage of health professionals we are number one among the 50 states in uninsured children that uninsured children rate has started to go back up after 10 years of going down when are we going to talk about health care mr speaker we have been talking about it yeah. and and y'all respectfully um reported wrongly we did not reduce uh the health care funding in our budget in our base budget now 
Unfortunately, I'm not the one to debate that with well, you. Well, well, Chairman Zerwas uh, is already debating it with us. He correct. says that that's not accurately reported, but as we calculated, Yay. yes, he was on me within about a minute. But as we, but cal- yet you still said it. I did, and I'm not, and I, I want to be convinced that it's not there because there does appear to be a reduction. Now, it may be about the federal match. It may be that that money is going to come back later. But it doesn't look like you have spent the time on budgeting for what are clearly hockey sticking health care costs the way you all did on public education. So reassure people that that is a focus of your attention. It is a focus of our attention. It is. Absolutely. I've heard and nothing mental yet. Health, and yeah. mental health. And mental let's health say, specifically. Because, Evan, let's be fair. You've heard mental health and health care talked about in the interim. And you're sure. hearing health care talked about even more. We actually used right. the rainy day fund for mental health, I believe. Um, don't quote me. Yeah, hundred million, I believe, from the rainy day fund for mental health. Yeah, and frankly, I think we can do more and do better. So you're focused on this. That. Yeah. Well, I am, but I can tell you, having finished this week, I've now met with over 140 members of the Texas House one on one. They're focused. They're, on they're focused on it. Um, w- during this last election cycle, we saw the voters of very red states, maybe even as red as Texas is whose elected officials, governors, members of the legislature, also Republicans, also conservative, had taken the concept of Medicaid expansion off the table. But those issues related to Medicaid expansion ended up on the ballot, and the voters of those very red states approved Medicaid expansion. I heard Governor Bullock of Montana today on the radio driving here from Austin. I was going to say, I don't think he's still here. No, no, not not Bob Bullock, Steve Bullock. I understand. Governor Bullock of Montana. Montana is a very red state. That very red state expanded Medicaid, and he said that their uninsured rate dropped from 20% to 7%. Is there any possibility that we will talk about Medicaid expansion this session, or would you entertain kicking it to the voters if we don't talk about it in the legislature? That's a question that I'm going to leave to the members of the House, and, of course, the Senate will speak to that too. But these are the type issues that the members are going to drive, Yeah, and they'll make that choice. You don't want to offer a point of view about that yourself. I'm, the only point of view is if you've right. been paying attention, I've really I offered her on education and property tax reform. Well, actually, I, I and saw I've you. have been yeah. limited on those. No, I get that. But I actually, but that's not entirely true, Mr. Speaker. I saw you interviewed on Lone Star Politics last weekend, and you were asked a direct question about whether you would bring a bill related to bathroom access to the floor of the House, as was a topic of conversation last session. And you said point blank three different times no. Yeah, I'll say it a fourth. Say yeah. it a fourth. Is there something, Mr. Speaker, is there something inconsistent with any speaker, you or your predecessor, who both have said, Mr. Strauss and and yourself have said, I I govern the House by the will of the members. The members make the decisions. To then turn around and say that a certain bill is not going to get to the floor of the House, I thought you let the members decide. What if the members want to put that bill on the floor? They've made it pretty clear they're not interested. They have. They have. So you've already taken uh, taken a vote of the members effectively in your own private conversations if you can't count votes in the house you don't right. become speaker all right so then let me ask you point blank yes mr speaker yes or no as it relates to the all business house that you intend to lead and the sharp objects that were on the table last session that tended to blow up the kumbaya let me ask you about those yes or no this time bathroom bill yes or no 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 vouchers in some form or fashion yes or no 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 real quick yeah I'm not going to force my positions on the House, but it is very clear there are nowhere near the votes in this House for vouchers. There haven't been for three sessions. But I, in 1997, I was a freshman legislator. Yes, sir. We had a vote on vouchers. Never happens. It tied. Two Republicans voted no. Myself and Terry Kill. Yep. I was told I'd never be back. You're back. I'm alive. Haven't changed your mind about that and issue. I haven't voted differently ever Got it. since. Um, okay, so uh, I saw Cesar Blanco, a Democrat of El Paso, participate in an event the other day talking about the possibility of rolling back SB4 sanctuary cities legislation and the question, larger question of would there be immigration-related or border security-related legislation that might have an impact on this session the way that SB4 did last time? Yes or no? I sure hope they don't choose to do that. Who's they in this case? The members? Well, Cesar Blanco says he's going to roll it back. Or, or they, he, he's only one uh, vote, of course. I mean, I we understand. don't know whether the votes are there. You think that there should be no uh, changes to SB4? I, I agree. Yeah. Correct. 
Uh, I hear advocates for public education when I ask them, if you want to put more money in the public ed, you're going to have to stop doing other things because we can't just add by adding. We have to add by subtracting. This is a conservative budget in a conservative state. The first place they go is the $800 million allocated every two years, each of the last two sessions for border security, which we've been told is really a federal responsibility. Can we stop spending that money this session on border security or will the 800 be back? Well, we have $900 billion additional above growth in our base budget for public education. Yeah. And there's $800 million in there to continue the border security. So your effort. intention is do the same again? My intention is that you don't have to sacrifice nine plus billion additional dollars to pub ed and not continue to right. meet. The failure is, I might, I'm, I'm not getting a lot of news these days, but I get just enough to know that they're continuing to fail to do anything in Washington on any issue. On, on the border. Um, no, any issue. Yeah, well, but, but on the border specifically, because if you, believe that the, yeah, if you believe it's a federal issue, one of the things has been when the federal government takes responsibility for this, maybe we can take that number down, but you're not satisfied that that's happened yet. Well, one, I'm not satisfied that it's happened, but two, that number is not simply placed on the border. The Governor Abbott's done a good job of discussing that we have a huge problem in this state with the MS-13 and the gang-related problems that happen in Houston and Dallas and are all over the state. And those dollars are also being spent for gang task force and supporting DPS and doing a better job of keeping Texans yep. all across our state safe. And you're satisfied that since you're about accountability and metrics that DPS is providing adequate accountability and metrics for how that money is being spent? Am I going to sit and say it's 100% right and they do everything perfectly? Gosh, no. But I think Texans deserve to be safe. Enough that it's in the base budget. Correct. Right. Um, people say Dennis Bonin would be a great speaker because he'll protect the House. He'll protect the House. He's an advocate for the House. What does that mean? You'd have to ask those saying it. You don't have a point of view about that? I mean, uh, you're, you're, you're... I'm a House guy. You're a House guy. I'm a House guy. What does that mean? Does that mean House versus Senate? No. What does that mean? Protect the House. You protect the institution of the House. Right. You do the things that I began talking about and doing um, the day I announced I had the votes and really in my process of running for speaker. You bring the House together. You make the House work effectively as a unit. You figure out how to let House members succeed on the issues that matter to them. And at the least, let them be heard on the issues that matter to them. So what you're protecting the House from is disunity and disharmony. You you're not protecting the House from some some present threat well you protect the house from anything that could be harmful to the institution that could be right. an internal threat it could be an external threat do you need to protect the house from the senate mr speaker right now i sure don't did you have to at the end of last session possibly are you conv are, are you are you satisfied that this kumbaya uh, running through the daisies moment with the lieutenant governor is going to persist until the end of the session well first off i'm offended there were no daisies all right there were dogs yeah okay there were dogs beautiful goldens yeah and, and, and dogs you, make people happy. You feel like you are aligned enough that you're not going to need to speak out against the Senate or the lieutenant governor's agenda on behalf of the House. That will not be well, part and parcel of protecting the House. I have no intentions of doing so. Yeah. Because the truth of it is, when you talk about what does it mean to protect the House, you have success on issues that matter to people in the House. And, right. and in turn, the people they represent. And you do that by not speaking out against the Senate or the lieutenant governor or the governor. We meet every Wednesday. Right. You can speak out to them directly. Privately. And privately. Right. And as I've said, the lieutenant governor and I are going to get along until we get these things and you And you and the governor as well. You and the governor are aligned. Never had a problem with the governor. Right. Will you advise the governor if he asks you about spending money out of his enormous campaign account against Republican members? Will you advise him not to do that again? I already have. You've told him he shouldn't have done it and he shouldn't do it again. The governor, I don't think, will do that in the future. You think the governor will not? Okay, good. Um, when the thought of you coming up as speaker uh, was a topic of conversation in Austin, we heard a lot about your temperament. People said Dennis Bonin's temperament is a factor. What does that mean exactly? I don't know. This is really pleasant. You seem like a very sweet guy to me. Um, but don't mess with the house. Is your reputation is is your reputation for knowing how to make a fist, uh, kind of a fact check true moment? People should not mess with you or mess with the house. That's going to be your attitude. I think that's a pretty fair statement. 
that is to outside threats as well as inside threats. Will you be tough with members of the Democratic Party or tough with members of the Freedom Caucus if they don't s snap into line? I think we'll not snap into line, and I, and I want to be clear about that because I think that's where there's confusion on, on those comments. If you are doing harm to the institution of the House, I will be a problem. You will have a problem. That's right. Okay, that's exactly right. Uh, back to this idea of bipartisanship and the message of the election. Well, you it's have not a, an idea; it's right. a reality. No, I get it. I get yeah. it. Uh, you're in an eighty-three sixty-seven House, Republicans and Democrats. Um, Lieutenant Governor, as we alluded to, named committees right before we walked up on stage. When will you be naming committees, Mr. Speaker? Well, if I wasn't having to visit with you, I'd be getting them. You might be doing it right now. There, there will be there will be an acceptance and an acknowledgement of the Democrats' place in the conversation when you make committee assignments, including chairs. Absolutely. Democrat chairs, Democrats on committees Absolutely. they want to be on, part of the conversation, all that's good. Most definitely. W will, will you be yeah. as equally satisfied as all the Republican members will be? Okay. And you know how that works. I do, I do. And, and again, you're, you're not going to tightly control the flow of legislation to the floor. You're going to let the members make that determination. Absolutely. But theoretically, you're not going to appoint committee chairs who disagree with the points of view that you may personally have on issues. You're not willing to let them control it that much, are you? So a pro-voucher chair of public education is not going to suddenly be in charge of that issue. Because that really... was the criticism of the last speaker, that he put people in who basically did his bidding. No, we're going to put the best members to do the job in right. those positions. Okay. Uh, the last speaker served five terms. That tied the record all time. Will you term limit yourself out of this job at a certain point? That's fashionable these days. No. The no. members have the choice to do that, but I don't plan to do five terms. My goal is to be the longest serving speaker in the history of Brazoria County, which is about 18 Hasn't that, already, hasn't that already happened? <laughs> That's right. I think you've already broken the record. I think I'm going to get there. Right. I want to ask you one last question before we open it up to the floor. Your mom is here. Yes. And your wife is here, yes. the two Mrs. Bonnets. Correct. I, 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 I'm, I have a wife. I have kids. I love family like most people. We in the media have hearts, it although it is surprising. Yeah. Um, I watched the day that you were sworn in as speaker. It was very moving to hear you talk about your family, to talk about your late father, to talk about your mother, and to talk about this district because you're still one of 150. That's right. You may be speaker, but you still represent District 25. That's why we're here. I wanted to do this event in Austin because we do a lot of events in Austin. I would have had to get to Irwin Center if we had done this in Austin. And we still would have had people left out. You said, I want to do this in my district. Actually, I didn't say I wanted to do it here. I said, we'll do it at Brazosport College or we won't do it. Right. Well, that's, <laughs> I think we're saying the same thing. I can confirm. This district still matters to you, and you've served in this district for a long time. What, the last thing I want to ask you is what, what have you taken away from family and this district that has shaped who you are as speaker? W where will we see the imprint on you as speaker? Oh, it's everything. There isn't something. It's all of it. Um, you know, I grew up in a family where, you know, my dad, a good Christmas vacation was painting his law office. Um, that was a good time. And uh, mowing yards, throwing Avon mints from the local fax newspaper. You, know, you talk about I've spent half my time in the house. Well, I threw the Brazosport fax newspaper as a kid. And I probably learned how to get votes by knocking on people's doors and collecting the money for the payment of their monthly subscription. Um, that's not fun. But. Um, it is everything is who I am. I mean, I've spent my entire life here. And um, it's kind of weird for Dr. Valak to say speaker. And candidly, I don't even like it. Um, I'm Dennis. This is who I am. These are the people I know. These are my friends and family. This is where I grew up. This is where I live. I'd always said, and when you say being a house guy, um, I'm not saying I would have won. But I could have run for the state senate. I didn't want to. Could have run for Congress. Well, you, you've been there long enough that you've had plenty of opportunities that you right. chose not to pursue. Right? And I chose not to. And it's the awkwardness of speaker. I chose not to, and no disrespect to those who do it. But when you become senator, you're called senator. When you become congressman, you're called congressman. But when you're a state rep, you're just Dennis. And I like being Dennis. 
and that's the thing I don't like about being speaker. I, I don't enjoy being right. called speaker or introduced to speaker because I'm just a kid from Anglican. Yeah, it's going to be hard to get all of us who introduce people not to call you speaker, full I, disclosure. I, I understand. All right, we've got microphones up here. Please uh, jump up and ask a question, and we'll get you in. As I said, we're going to end at 1 o'clock, but we'll take as many questions as time permits. Please ask a question, not a, give a speech. Sir? Is it working? Yeah, Good. go ahead. You're great. How you doing, Mr. Speaker? Good. Uh, we now have a first step, if you will, of criminal justice reform at the federal level. There's actually talk of them working on a second step. Yep. Um, are we going to have a first step at the state level of comprehensive criminal justice reform? And yep. is there going to be a priority for you? What, what are you thinking about there? Well, I, I know that uh, my dear friend Joe Moody is passionate about the issue, and there are several other members who are. Um, I don't mean to disappoint you, but I'm not going to dictate those issues to the membership. I've been very clear about that. But if there is support of 76-plus members in the Texas House to do criminal justice reform, I won't be getting in their way. And that's across the board. That, that's without regard to specific verticals. Correct. Sentencing reform, bail reform. If, if, if there is the majority of the support in the House and the members want to drive that right. issue forward. My job is to help them get to a consensus on the right. issues. Will you allow a bill reforming marijuana laws, which is kind of the bonbon of the moment around the country on, on ballots? Will you allow that if, to come if, to the floor? If, if there is a fair majority of support and the members want that issue to happen, I'm not going to get in their way. Now, with that said, I don't think there is support in the Texas House. Right. Uh, to legalize marijuana or do anything out. Or decriminalize. Or decrim decriminalization is a very vague statement. Yeah. Because I think there are different levels of what that is. Well, you don't, like. you don't sound enthusiastic about that issue. No, I'm not going to speak for the members, right. is my point. Right. We'll see what they have to say. Ma'am. Hi, Dennis. My name is Kirsten Ricketts. And uh, one of the real issues, like the gentleman said, um, that will be on the platform this legislation is criminal justice reform. Somewhere between 49 and 51 percent of all those incarcerated in TDCJ fall under a classification that prohibits them from earning credit towards parole eligibility. We are holding people within the institution sometimes 20, 30, or even 40 years without reviewing them. Question, please. Okay, I'm getting uh, that's there. That's not accurate. And they've lost hope. Um, TDCJ's base budget was $6.53 billion for 2018 to 19. And I think that some of the money that we're using to warehouse human beings could be better used for educating our youth Qu in marginalized communities. Question, please. Question, that's, please. That's the question. Can we transfer the funds to education instead of forcing people to remain warehoused? All right, Mr. Well, Speaker, I is there money I, in criminal justice to be moved over? I don't think it's an if or. And I also think that if you have done harm to a te fellow Texan, and you have been sentenced by a jury of your peers, you've earned the right. And I disagree. Uh, one of the issues I'm very proud of that I have worked on was on parole set-offs. Yes. And I don't have the facts in front of me, but I find it very hard to believe that someone in TDCJ today has not been reviewed for parole in 20 or 30 years because it's, the, well, okay. it's against the law. Um, the longest someone can be set off for parole is 10 years, and I'm the one who changed that. It was before I changed it to 10, it was only five. And we had someone who was running pardons and parole who was requiring a parole set off every three years. So I, I'd be welcome to get the facts from you if you see them differently, but they would be breaking the law if that was occurring. Thank you. Ma'am. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, earlier uh, in this talk, I heard you allude to the fact that you are not fearing not being reelected because you sit in a safe Republican district. My question to you is, is the legislature, particularly your house, doing anything to prepare for redistricting in 2021? Good. And subsequently, do anything to improve the redistricting process to make it more transparent so that we have bipartisan areas instead of strictly Good. partisan areas? Do you think there's a problem to fix? Well, I mean, 12 seats flipped three months ago. So I would say that's pretty bipartisan areas. Um, and the reality, well, I'm sorry if it didn't go the way you wanted it to, but the reality of it is when you have 12 seats flipped from one party to the other, that's a pretty significant change. With that said, um, one of the most litigated and, 
and fought over things that ever happens is redistricting. Right. Um, so I think it's hard to say it's not transparent. Um, you actually have access to uh, all the map drawing and all of those things on the uh, internet and the website. And the reality of it is, though, to your simplest question is, will we be working on redistricting this right. session? Yes, the work for that will begin real quick this session, but more significantly, it's in the interim. Uh, I fully expect that the redistricting committee will travel the state of Texas after we finish session in the 18 months leading right. up to the session where redistricting is required, and they will hear from people all over the state. Are you concerned, Mr. Speaker, about the various courts that have found uh, instances of what they believe are intentional discrimination on the part of map drawers in this state previously, and what will you do to address concerns by voters, perhaps this one or elsewhere, that the maps are drawn unfairly and possibly exhibit intentional discrimination? We want maps to be drawn fairly and without discrimination, and that's the way it should be done. Okay, sir. Mr. Speaker, Texas has a uniquely impractical two-year constitutional budget requirement. Would you support a Texas constitutional amendment for a brief Texas annual legislative session exclusively for passing an annual Texas state budget? That's a great question. If there are 100 members who want to change the Constitution, I won't stand in their way. But you're not willing to offer a point of view on that any more than the other stuff we talked about. It is important as Speaker that you don't dictate to the members. Let me give an example. Sure. Um, in the discussion of who the next Speaker would be, one of the big issues was the House rules. Right. And, and why I'm being cautious so everyone can understand is that when the Speaker says that matters, it changes what members will then do. Yes. And if you start doing that on the policy issues in Texas, members don't represent their districts the way they're supposed to. And if you mention you have a point of view on one thing but not another, people misread it and think That's that on correct. that second issue you don't really care. That's exactly right. So would you, would you write a two-year budget for the bank and expect that you could run your business with a two-year budget knowing what's going to happen two years out? Well, we're required by regulators to do a five-year uh, estimate Right. And five-year projections. Now, you're right. We would probably do it every year. We do do it every year. Right. But we are required by state and federal examiners to do a five-year projection on our budgets. Yeah. And then they come back and grade us. So that's not something that you feel like the House – I mean, there's, you're saying, again, members will determine that. But that's you're not, trying. But I am trying. let the members decide. Do you, do you think that there needs to be a reform of how the rainy day fund is invested along the lines of – just since we're talking about the budget – along the that's lines of what the comptroller Rangers. wants to do where you'd have a floor and then you would invest above a certain point in the legacy fund that could then turn around and be invested in the priorities of the state? I've heard from members of the House that they have interest in looking at that. So that will be a topic of conversation. I think there are members who want it to be. Therefore, right. Ma'am. Yes. Um, Mr. Speaker, I understand that you supported removing the um, Confederate plaque from the state capitol. Is that true? Yes. Would you also agree that um, the Women's Right to Know Act should be reversed because it mandates that doctors should give inaccurate information to female patients? I'm not certain what you're referring to. The Women's Right to Know what, what exactly is that? And, and I'm not sure it's inaccurate. If what, it's What's a, inaccurate? It's a Texas law. That no, I'm not debating whether it's a law. I'm, I'm asking specifically. That, debates, that, that mandates that doctors give female patients inaccurate information. What's inaccurate? I'm, I don't know what's inaccurate. Um, saying that abortions can cause infertility or cancer. I'm not interested in repealing that. You're not, not, not interested in repealing so that. You're no. okay Thank you. with lies. Sure. From well, your perspective, yes. Well, Sir? Congratulations, Mr. Speaker. My name is John Harris from the Alzheimer's Association. Um, uh, we uh, would be interested to know how you intend to make Alzheimer's disease a priority in this legislation, considering that there's close to 400,000 right. Texans dealing with this disease. Well, again, the members will make that choice, but I think the fact that we are very concerned and interested in issues of, and not that Alzheimer's is mental health, but health care and mental health issues and putting more dollars towards research and, and those issues. I met the days run together. It might have been yesterday I went and met with the UT presidents, but um, we talked about CPRT, and, of course, that's cancer funding, but we're talking about research funding on a whole right. to help improve Texas li Texans' lives 
on these diseases that affect all of us. And, and CPRID is about to hit its 10-year mark, is That's it not? Right. So will it be reauthorized or reconsidered to be back for another period of time? Um, I actually walked out of that meeting and looked at my chief of staff and said, we need to go get the details on CPRIT, and do we need to reauthorize it now and what's going on? So I don't have the facts. Of but that's on your radar screen right Absolutely. now. Absolutely. Right. Okay. It's an important thing for Texas. I'm being told by my colleague that it is 1 o'clock. I've committed to getting you out of here at 1. My apologies to the people who didn't get to ask questions, and my great thanks to Speaker Dennis Bonin. Please give him a big hand. Thank, Thank you, you for all, all of you for being here. We'll see you again.